So, Kyle, if you do fade, let's say, the one through four in the Dodgers lineup, would you be inclined to either stack the back end, back end like David has kind of mentioned, as a as a sneaky stack that you can get through at a low ownership? Or would you take potentially like one player of that stack just to have a piece or maybe one player from the one to five just to get access to the Dodgers that day? And hopefully your guys hits the rest of the guys bust and all of a sudden you're looking great. Yeah, I think you could do, you know, a few different combinations. You can potentially just lower the stack a bit, maybe you go two, three guys, and hopefully the, when the field's stacking four or five of them, maybe they, they score five runs instead of 11, and, you know, the two or three guys that you get right are the are the right ones, or you can go the lower end, back of the end guys, or you can do something really crazy, like sometimes I find myself doing is just using the pitcher on the opposing side. Now, I don't probably recommend using, like, the pitcher for the Rockies on opening day against the Dodgers, but – for example, let's say one day randomly the Marlins are, are a popular stack and everyone wants to play the, the Marlins because they're going against maybe an unknown pitcher for whatever reason. Going against that, going against that grain, taking that leverage and then actually doubling down on it, using the pitcher against them is sometimes a cool way to do it. I know uh, in the, at the DraftKings Live Final in 2019 in Chicago, I did that in one of the more popular stacks in that that field, that slate. I used the pitcher in that and ended up working out pretty well. I finished six in that. So sometimes it pays off to double down on that leverage and double down on that fade by actually getting some leverage and countering it. So, David, how much does this make a difference depending on how many people are in a tournament? So if you're playing in whatever the giant tournament is on DraftKings that day with the highest guaranteed prize pool, let's say it's a giant $10, $20, whatever it might be, I would guess that ownership matters more in something like that than you know a smaller field tournament, maybe a three max, maybe a single entry, something like that. Uh, yeah, I would say so too. And I would say, say you're playing a tournament at the $10 tournament, the huge one, there's uh, 80,000 people in it. I, I would say it's not even as important to stack in those kind of tournaments. Um, just because the variance is so high. I mean, you want to get like a two or three man stack, but you don't have to go four and four and, and throw in a random guy. If you're trying to make money at doing this, you want to play single entry stuff. You really just want to play play cash games and, and keep doubling your bankroll if you can or doubling the amount you play. I mean, take out a calculator, put $5 in it, and then hit times two, then times two, times two, and see how quickly that money adds up. That's how you build a bankroll, and that's how you make money at it. But if you're going in as a brand new player in these 150 max tournaments, just know that you're playing guys that do this all day long and play 150 lineups, and they're trying to cover as many bases as they can, although you cannot cover all your bases. That's impossible. People think you can do it. You can't do it. But it's going to be very, very hard to take the top prize in one of those large tournaments as opposed to just cashing double ups, 50 50s, 100 man max or uh, three max, 100 man tournaments or, or single entries. 